Well, it's day six, and I guess, like everyone else, I am a bit tired and worn out with all that's going on, and who can blame us, right? So, when back in 2000, I stood um, by a little, when I was going through a bit of a, you know, issues, I mean, not issues, uh, just uh, emotional things, um, because I, I was made redundant around about, who 2001. And so I understand when people lose jobs, I really, really get it, guys. Or when you become unemployed, and then you get into a cycle of uh, you, 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 uh, you try really hard to get back into the workforce. You get your CVs out there, and there is no jobs available and such. Hopefully, the best thing with employment. I know that some people have already lost their jobs a week before this happened. Well. In the middle of it but before we went into lockdown had already lost their jobs in in our community in, in northland so i understand when people um, um get a bit down uh, after you know uh, especially males uh, this is something that somebody i mean a lot of people don't understand is that males are really focused that um that their work means a lot to them and um uh, and because, because it means so much to us to keep busy, to be a provider, to make sure that our children, our family, our partners are looked after. And, uh, and I understand that our mum, mum, solid mums and stuff and our solid dads and stuff. So please don't, you know, think that I'm just, you know, pushing that aside and that's not important. But um, being, you know, coming from my own personal perspective on this is that when you, uh, you know, when you find that you've um, suddenly become unemployed for whatever reason. I was made red redundant at the age of 27 after working for a business for seven years. When they got hit hard, I was the first one to go, even though I was a huge, huge uh, income earner for them. So it doesn't matter if you're a top salesman or top worker. Uh, when the times had hard, the person that owns the business is going to look after themselves first because they want to survive and they want to be able to provide for themselves first because it's not a bad thing to look after yourself first, but that's what happens. So I'd just been married for about eight months or something and nearly wed everything in my own apartment, you know, um, had bills to pay, um, you know, everything. And I was the only one employed at that time. And so when I lost my job, I was really down i don't know how to speak to people how to express the emotions that i had how to um say hey look i am i'm so frustrated right now emotionally wound up i didn't know how to speak to people about that and you're going to find the same thing happens with you right now and also mums will find the same thing if you're if you're a solo mom working you know or, or if you're the only even if you if you're in a relationship or husband wife whatever married and if you're the only breadwinner in that family you're going to find it really stressful right now, uh, wondering if you're going to be employed after this, or depending on what you, you know, what business or what uh, company you're with. So I, uh, I implore you to really, really sit down and explain it to your family. I made a mistake when I didn't, and I found that it became um, a thing where the distance became further and further apart. And the worst thing is that when you're further, when that distance is there, when it comes from a little thing, we could just say, hey, look, this is what, I'm, you know, right at the side, you're going to say, hey, this is what I'm feeling. Everything, all that hard work and everything I put into this business or company, is, even if you're a small business owner yourself, um, and now I'm, I can't afford to buy food for you. I can't afford to pay the bills on time. So the best thing to do right away is to sit down and go, hey, this is what the situation is. We will need to scrimp back a bit. We will need to um, not expand on so much stuff that we're used to. We need to understand that uh, we have to, bills comes first. Food, then bills comes first. You've got to keep the lights on. And if you don't do that right at the start, you're going to find it, like I said, the distance will go further between your relationship, and with, especially with your children as well. They will, they will be looking to you as an adult going, hey, you know, what's going on? And you have to sit them down right away and go, hey, as you know, this is happening and there might be a possibility or there is a possibility or there, it has happened that I've lost my job. Um, and so, excuse me. 
So you, when you sit down and talk to them and tell them that straight from the start, they'll appreciate it when it gets harder, when you're finding it harder to explain, because then they'll know, hey, mom and dad set me down, especially when you have kids, you know, um, and they explained what the problem was, why mom and dad can't afford what we want right now, why I can't get that expensive toy I was I wanted to get, or the, even the cheap toy I was trying to get, even that's going to be hard as well, because everybody wants to be fed right now, right? And the bills have to be paid. So if you start sitting down right at the start and explaining all this, it'll be easier for you. But if you try being like the one thing I always think about is the ambulance at the bottom of the hill and you're at the top and you're injured at the top or you're feeling down at the top, it's going to, it's going to be harder for the ambulance to reach you. But if you're at the bottom, right? And you explain it to the, and you're at the bottom and injured, right now and explain to your kids and stuff the ambulance is there to help you the kids will be there to go oh we understand mom and dad so they, their stress levels will go down and your stress level will go because then you, you've already explained this and so later on you don't have to get all stressed out you don't have to get you know physical you know and i implore not to do that with them uh, to try to get their point across and and it'll be easier if you do it now to say explain to them hey this is a situation Kids, partner, spouse, this is the situation now. So, please, you know, this is the time to sit down, like I said, and explain to them how the hardships are going, might come or already here, and they'll and they'll appreciate it, and they and you'll find that they'll they will actually connect with you on a on a higher level that you haven't thought about before. That they'll be able to just appreciate it a bit more because you were there for them right from the start. And that's the same thing about raising kids. I found that if you if you if you're right there and explaining to children how to how they should behave and stuff and how the hard times are, then they'll they will be they'll get grow up knowing all these rules and regulations that they have to abide by the boundaries. And if, one thing I found is like I've watched this in my own family, wider family with my extended families and the children there. They're so much more caring and loving if they've been raised right from the start to be that way. But sometimes we find that a lot of kids, are, you know, not done that way. So they end up, you know, causing problems later on as they grow up and they go, well, mom and dad didn't tell me this and this. And, and then you sort of go, well, why are they like this? Well, they that's the Dutch. So have the ambulance at the, be at the, right, be with the ambulance at the bottom, not at the top. So I just want to, um, I, I, the reason I've raised that is because I was going to talk about this, these little, two, two little books I picked up in my heydays of you know depression and losing work and stuff and even i think prior to that i used to like like hang on to little things that people used to give me like notes and stuff sorry about that uh, and i would um i would look to them every time i felt um down or something and so here's here's a book i picked up i don't know when or if it was given to me i think i picked it up myself because there's no notes on this so this is called um look on the bright side I know it's, you know, yeah. But, so let me read you a couple of things. The true optimists of life are not always those who have always had things easy and know things of care or trouble. Neither are the ones who res resolutely refuse to acknowledge the presence of sin and sorrow. Troubles and sorrow, if you want to think of it that way. So the true optimists of life are not always those who always had things easy and know nothing of care or trouble. Neither are they the ones who resolutely refuse to acknowledge the presence of sin and sorrow, trouble and sorrow, depressions, blues. The true optimists, optimists of life, optimistics, optimists of life, are those who determine to meet facts honestly and give themselves eagerly, untiringly, untiringly to fighting the trouble and lessening the sorrow and the pain. So basically, the guy is saying, people who are optimistic aren't those who have never had it easy. They just see the problems and learn to deal with them. So that's from the look look on the bright side little note uh, little book there. And here's another one for since I was talking about parents. This is called. Um, I don't sweat the small treasury. A, a special collection for new parents. 
can be for any parents, right? Richard Carlson, PhD. Professor, I guess. So, he's got a little thing here. I'm going to read this little one here. It goes, don't sweat the small stuff. Often we allow ourselves to get all worked up about things that, upon close examination, aren't really that big a deal. I might put this up uh, as screenshots later. We focus on little problems and concerns and blow them blow them way out of proportion. A stranger, for example, might cut in front of us in traffic. Rather than let it go and go on with our day, we convince ourselves that we are, that we are justified in our anger. Many of us might even tell someone else about the incident later on rather than simply let it go. Why not instead simply allow the driver to have his accident somewhere else? Try to have compassion for the person and remember how painful it is to be in such a such an enormous hurry. This way we can maintain our own sense of well-being and avoid taking other people's problems personally. There are many similar small stuff examples that occur every day in our lives. Whether we had to wait in line, listen to unfair criticism, or do the lion's share of the work, it pays enormous dividends if we learn not to worry about little things. So many people spend so much of their life energy sweating the small stuff that they completely lose touch with the, with the magic and beauty of life. When you commit to working together toward this goal, you will find that you will have far more energy to be kinder and gentler. And like I said, that's what I've, for the last two years, that's what I've been focusing on. It's just not sweating the small stuff. And I found that I have more energy to do other stuff. And today for me, like I was, I was up all night and I slept most of the day. Uh, I think from 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock or something like that. Because um, I'm trying to get in critical already, and I'm also tasked myself with doing another project. You'll see that on uh, Plunge Enterprises and that. I'll put the link up there if you've not joined our business page. Okay, so uh, let's get down to pop culture. Right, so Ghostbusters um, Afterlife and Mobius has been pushed to 2021. 2021. What, 2021? Yeah, 2021. Because obviously, you know, uh, the studios are shut, uh, Hollywood's shut, people are at home uh, locked down, uh, no work is being done in the productions. Um, so I guess apart from what it already fil uh, filmed, and I guess uh, with um, having what they've already filmed, they could, the animators could do some work, and that's about probably it, or the CGI technicians. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's uh, Afterlife and Mobius. And of course, like I said yesterday, there'll be several, if not dozens of productions that'll be like that. Um, and because everybody's been hit hard in the industry. Okay, so let's get down to um, DC, DC Comics have basically, in my opinion, have uh, stabbed the comic shops in the back by rather than not releasing digital copies and waiting for the print uh, turnaround for when the shops open, they've decided that they're going to release digital copies. And so they're going to give digital co um, sell digital copies right now of the comics that are supposed to come out this month and the next two months. For, as, as a comic sell, um, um, retailer in the past, I own my own comic shop. You guys, most of you guys already know that. That is a kind of like a stab in the back because... The most important thing for comic books, the pop, comic book people that, unlike people who have never heard of comic books, come into contact with, apart from what we know now with movies and stuff, but people who actually watch the movies don't buy comic books, and that's a proven fact, right? The people who just, you know, a majority, ninety percent of them, don't go into comic books and comic. Sorry about that. Thought I better lower it a bit, but I need my put my elbows down to, uh, to go into shops to buy comic books. Right, they don't really worry about comic books that much. So, no, even if you make a billion dollar movie, all you're selling is merchandise, you're not actually selling the comic books. The only people that are actually buying the comic books are the guys like my age and a bit younger who have been supporting the industry for 30, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Right, uh, they're the same people who are uh, passing it on to their grandchildren or their children or their nephews, so on. All right, and getting them interested in the medium. So for digital, uh, for DC Comics to go out and say, "Hey, we're going to put out digital copies now," while you comic shop guys are shut, after years of having their support, decades, right, of having comic shop support, they basically stabbed them in the back. 
and that's that's my personal opinion because i think and, and a lot of people share this and a lot of people that own shops share this view that, that yeah you've basically just stabbed the uh, the small business owners in the back after having so much support the thing about um, dc and marvel is that they basically have a contract with the stores that they have to allow so much shelf space to on their on, in their shops to those two companies and the, everybody else comes later so 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 that's why I'm saying that for decades that, that they've had all that shelf space, they've made sure that nobody else can have that top shelf space. Everybody else has to be at the bottom while they're at the top. So now you basically aren't producing, you know, you're not waiting for the, this to be over so that you can wait, you know, that people can still subscribe and still pay uh, money to the shop owners for their comics because they're all subscription based at two months in advance. So people have already paid for their comic books. Right, they already ordered two months in advance, and that's from experience as a comic seller, and also as a as a customer. Um, that that's what happens. So you go in, uh, a, you know, preview, a diamonds thing comes out, and of course diamonds is this is the reason that's happened because the diamonds are just crap, right? Um, because they're not publishing anymore, they're not sending anything out, and then they've said they're indefinitely they're not mostly indefinitely that they're going to do this. So that's basically caused every you know the main people to panic mainstream um, producers to panic so because they've had the shelf space and pushed everybody down where you know when they come back in they'll want the shelf space again if i was a comic shop owner now i would bring all those down when we come out of this i would bring all that down to the bottom marvel and dc to the bottom put all the people who have supported us at the top at this time those people who said 100 percent returnability uh i think um, some other companies are 50 percent uh Marvel's doing 50%, right? So even if you're... If, because here's the thing about uh, comic stores. You have to buy those comics 100%. You can't return them. Back in the old days, you could just rip off the cover and send the cover, post all the covers back. They weren't sold. And then those covers would end up at the second store or in the free bin, right? Months down the road. And then you could go pick up or you could pass them to the kids. I have some of those from the back in the day because I still like that, you know, that nothing's wrong with the inside of that. And so... You can't do that anymore, right? You can't do that um, because you have bought it. It's yours. So that's why people start selling dollar comics. They, just, they say like a kilogram comics for 20 bucks or something or whatever amount they want to get rid of because it just sits there. And the reason for this is because for the last five years, as I mentioned, they've been putting, producing rubbish. One of the rubbishes, coming back to what's present day, Yesterday, uh, today we found out that a new uh, Gotham comic series is coming out. Bruce Wayne is an Asian American, so he's basically from um, Hong Kong, China, somewhere, right? And this is this whole, as I mentioned, uh, Twilight, Batman Twilight, right? So there's a there's a triangle at at high school. I hate triangles. The whole idea of triangles is that one person mainly the female and they always do it as a female has two male um male um friends whatever who are basically buying for her interest her love interest and that's why i call it twilight because it's just the worst situation to be in because all you find is that someone's playing with your emotions and then people go well why is you know why is why are they getting all stressed out? Why is the guy stressed out here? Why is the guy stressed out? Here? Because someone's playing with their emotions, and this is one something that I just don't like in society as a whole, where a uh, you know where someone's playing with people's emotions because ma males are not really emotional. Right at the side of that I said, uh, if you you know if you're watching, join me now. Thank you for joining me now. If you uh, you know joining me, and um, at the start I talked about how males work. And uh, especially when losing jobs and stuff and how to help get through that with the kids and family. Um, so I don't really like the idea of having stories where people are basically, sometimes can work, of course, if done properly. And, you know, it's up to the to do that. But the whole idea is they basically decided they're going to do a love triangle. And Selena Kyle and some other guy and Bruce Wayne at high school. Um really what a bad 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 situation i guess they watched riverdale riverdale did really well so let's do that and with you know as well as watching twilight they did really well but really i don't like the idea of people playing with people's emotions especially if i'm a male and having my emotions played with uh, and some chicks trying on the side to do with somebody else 
You try that with a female. You be a male and have two females. Check out what's going to happen there, right? And, you know, you can't do that. So why would you want to do that with a male with, uh, and have two males trying to vibe with the interest of females? Just say no, not interested, and go with the one you like. Why play that? And that's why I don't like that. The whole storyline just sucks. But now, Alfred is Chinese. They call it Asian. I don't know why. But I don't like the idea, and I was thinking about this yesterday, of just lumping all of us as Asians. I'm not Asian. I'm Indian. So why am I being called Asian? I'm not from India. I'm from Fiji. So the idea of everybody being just lumped into Asia, even though they've never been born there, or because we're part of the diaspora, right? The Indian diaspora, because we moved around a lot. And as does everybody else. So you can't basically call Europe, um, Kiwis European because they're now Kiwis and they're New Zealanders. So you can't now call them European. Why, why? So I don't like the idea of like uh, lumping all of us into the Asian content. I like the fact that they're Orient. And you could say, well, there's Japan, Korea, uh, China, Malaysia, um, the top tier. Orient, what's wrong with it? And, and then say, well, we don't even call us uh, Indians and uh, Asians because call them Indians, right? But I hate the whole fact of lumping everybody into that because what that makes is a stereotype. I hate stereotypes. Stereotypes is a cheap way to write a story and a character, right? Um, and it can be fun, like Apu was fun. I liked Apu. I didn't, sometimes I don't like the fact I was being called like Apu, but who cares? It's fun. And the character was fun. And now it feels really weak not having that representation in Simpsons, but of course there were some Indians who didn't like it, right? And at first, I didn't like it at well, but I got used to it. I thought it was fun. It just gave people a look into the culture. But this whole idea of turning uh, turning Batman into an Asian, turning Alfred into an Asian, turning um, his parents or his grandmother's the billionaire. So he inherits his, who's an Asian, inherits his, um, the bill, um, his grandmother, Asian grandmother's billions. Right? And so, and also... Um, <laughs> Alfred is now a part of the LGBT um, community. And so you're basically retconning the whole identity of these iconic characters who have been around for 90, 100 years. And um, 80 years, I guess, 90 years. So this is what I don't like. Uh, I like the idea of new characters. They could have just created a new character. There was a friend of him, you know, and they've done that in the past. Why not? But why retcon to this extent? It's just silly... Un, uh, uneducated, un life experienced, and unexperienced comic book writing. This person who who's writing this uh, is basically said her her partner watched the Batman animated series. She had no connection to that. This whole thing. This is what I don't like: is that writers who have no connection to the characters, or who actually have read the books or stuff, or seen what every other character, writer has done, and then come up with how to work on that so she just basically decided i'm going to twist turn this on the table and do this and guess what the books i'm going to sell it might sell to a you know eighteen thousand copies compared to a hundred thousand if it they'd just left it it is and done a really good writing write-up of it and of course we've seen the x-men um movie um animated right um how they were at school watch the x-men animated series right brilliant brilliant no complaints Amazing at high school. And the entire X-Men school, right? right? Xavier School for Gifted Children is a school. Watch how that's done. If you want to write, none of those characters were changed. None of those characters were retconned. They were just at school, learning how to be themselves. And, you know, they introduced new characters all the time. And it was fun. And it was exciting. Okay. So the other thing is the She-Hulk um, writer, uh, Dana Schwartz. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I think when this came out about her going off about South Park and so saying how it's toxic and all this thing without realizing that it's a s sarcasm. They basically make fun of everybody and they poke fun at society as a whole. And she just got, you know, they asked, well, what are your qualifications for writing this? Do you have any experience in this character? Of the She-Hulk, because she's this is a TV series the She-Hulk they're going to put on, um, I guess Disney, because Disney owns Marvel now, or has owned Marvel for a while now, and so they're making all these TV shows. So they, she was asked later, you know, this past week, hey, 
right? So how do you, you know, what, you know, why, why are you doing things this way, if, you know, and so on? What are your experience of writing this? Have you ever written these comics before? Do you know what the background of these characters is? And she basically had a meltdown, like serious meltdown. She said that all males are bad, all males are toxic, and this is the thing, right? What it's like? Imagine, um, say, uh, well, the closest is uh, Ryan Johnson, right? He got so much flack. So say if he got a uh, he got a complaint, uh, like a critique, um, asked the same question because he got asked heaps of questions about Star Wars. They're like, what are you doing with these characters? Do you have any experience in them? You know, do you know who these characters are? And if he would turn around and said, "You're all bad females." They're all, you know, you guys are all gatekeepers. You females are bad, 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 toxic females, right? Imagine that being the case. How much backlash you would get over this. So, so Dana Schwartz is basically saying the same thing. So she's got asked by some guy, hey, what are your qualifications? What's your experience? What's that? Just as I mentioned just before with the Batman lady, right? With the um, Gotham High. She had no experience in this. Like I said, I will never want to write Batman or thing because I've never really those characters have. Um, even though I love them so much, they have no connection to me on that level that where I'd want to actually step out and write them. So if you if you want to if you get the opportunity to write them, you do a research. And the reason I say about research is because when I was think when I was my my brother um, who introduced me to my own uh, culture, right. Uh, uh, in about 2005, when I was at film school, he said, do you know about our history of how we've came to Fiji? And I said, what do you mean? Like, I thought we'd always been there because I hadn't really thought about that. I'm, I was, I've been here in New Zealand since I was about eight or seven or eight, right? And so I have no connection on that historical level to Fiji. So, or, you know, and so, because I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not Kiwi, right? If you're 40 years in, in the country, you're that country and your culture, you 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 um, you gravitate towards that culture, you gravitate to your friends in that culture, you know, so on. And you become, you know, your whole mindset's become where you live, especially after 40 years, right? So at that time, I guess I was 20 something, 30 years old, uh, 32, yeah, 2005. So he, yeah, it was just, he sent me an email and said, hey, you know, on Facebook, I said, hey, and I said, no, no. So I sat down for five years, read as many books as I could and researched the whole uh, diaspora and the Gurumit era, which is what's called in Fiji, which is a breakdown of the word indenture, right? Um, it's a kind of like uh, Gurumit, agreement. So Indians, because they couldn't pronounce the word agreement, they thought it was Gurumit. So now we're all called, they were called Gurumits. So the idea of that is, uh, researching into that, I found about how we ended up there, how I, one of the first ships that got, came there, crashed there uh, in Suva, on the bay there, because there's rocks, huge, huge rocks under the water there. The first ship came in with these laborers and crashed. This is about 19, sorry, 1885. So in 1885, right, um, this is after 15 years after slavery. So slavery all across the world ended in about 1860. So because there was all these plantations going to rot around the world where slaves had been used for labor, right? Uh, so what happened was then they said, well, we got all these plantations. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, brother. Alex has said, uh, keep doing these videos, mate. I thoroughly enjoy your talks. Cheers, man. I'm, I try to come up with as new content as I can. So yeah, so the Gurumit era. So 1885, right? So 15 years after all the all this all these plantations are just basically going to ruin, and so they decided uh, the British Commonwealth decided that all their Commonwealth countries, Fiji was part of it, New Zealand was part of it, Australia is part of it, and Mauritius, um, Ghana, so many other countries, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, uh, I think Indo as well. So wherever you see a a, a tiger, that's where Indians in that time move to that's why you see some of the asian countries like malaysia and philippines they have slightly browner skin right because of that because they basically married into that uh, into those into their community into the asian community orient community right um so and they were just not they weren't just like indians they were um, muslims they were like sri lankans uh north indians south indians 
so many uh, cultures moving into there. So, so, so basically what had happened was, and this is part of my, my own graphing novel that I've, that I've put aside. I've, I've done about 40 pages of that. I've put aside, it's going to be at 120 pages or so. So it's called the Gurumit. And um, talking about which, just in case. I'll... So way back when, so when I found out, I asked my, uh, my friend, James Collins, who I went to a film school with at the time, who was an artist, right, uh, and is an artist now as well, to do a, um, I commissioned him to, rep to do a representation of um, that situation, right? And how, how terrible it was for them and stuff. So before getting to the chapel, so basically, you know, the British Commonwealth shipped out, um, no, what happened was that they basically went into India and said, well, what's our biggest population, uh, you know, as part of our Commonwealth? Well, Indians, right? People living in India at the time, you know, um, these people would love, you know, we've got all these plantations all over the world, across the islands, across the mainlands and other countries. And Africa, I forgot to mention Africa, right? That's why there's a huge, huge generations of and people in, uh, in Africa, Indians in Africa. And, um, and so, so what they did was they have like all these um, people, Right, who would sometimes cheat people into and lie to them to tell them, "Hey, Fiji for us." Right, let's. I'm having research Fiji, so for five years, so I'm just talking about Fiji. So Fiji is just across there. This is just an island, just across, you know, a hundred miles down the road, you know, across the ocean. Yeah, you you can come back and visit whenever you want, right? So, but a lot of them, this, um, you know, a bit more business-minded, doctors, nurses, uh, engineers, and stuff. They understood how far it was because they could look it up on the on the map that it was at the time. This is 1885, but a lot of the poor people had no idea, and some of them like basically were lied to to get them on the ship because the people like the salespeople right would be out there. Um, the sales rep will be for the companies will be out there going, hey hey hey, you'll get so much money, you'll get so much money, you'll go so many years, you can come back, it'll be all fine and all this. So the, the, the idea was to um, sign a contract, the agreement, the indenture labor agreement for five years, and then you could come back. So they ended up in Fiji, and like I said, the first boat crashed, the ship, Leonidas crashed off the coast of Fiji as it was coming into the harbor. Uh, some, a lot of people drowned, and a lot of people actually died on the way there, uh, through malaria, through scurvy, through starvation, uh, lack of water, uh, so many different things, diseases and stuff, and on the way there. So many ships came. So that's what the Gurmit graphic novel, when it's finished, will be about. But so I didn't know about all this. So I went and researched for five years because I wanted to know, because I wanted to know my history. And, so, and at the start, I got really angry uh, because of the treatment they got. And then I listened to other things. I read the other historical things, and then I realized that I'm here because of what they went through, but also a lot of them were willing to come because they wanted a better life. I know the extremely poor people, because Fiji, uh, India, and it still has that, is a caste system, which means whatever uh, level of poverty you are born into, or religious uh, level right whatever level you are in, that's your entire life you can never get past that you will always be in there unless somehow you get education that's excuse me it's getting quite hot in here yeah back had to open the window now the breeze is coming through so yeah, so whatever uh, car system, because of none of your, none of your, because nothing you ever did, you just were born into that family, into that village. That's where you're ever going to stay for the rest of your life. So a lot of people just said, yeah, get me on that boat, get me the hell out of here. Get me out of, um, get me out of India. I, I would like to raise my children in another place. I'm willing to work five years to do that. And I learned... 
that once you understand history and you're open to understand both sides of it, that you don't become angered, you you become educated and you actually have a, a better outlook on life. You appreciate the good and you understand the bad. And that allows you to basically have a better idea about how to treat people of all cultures, how to, um, how to appreciate what's gone before and what's, uh, what's to come. And you decide to be the positive things in life and not the negative things. Sure, there's been some, you know, you can say, well, this is how my people were treated. This is how that happened. And if you carry that on your back as a chip, you'll pass that on to your children. And I see that all the time. I see, uh, I see that. I, I come across that uh, in my, you know, in my life, where people are just basically don't want to point out the negatives in their own culture, but they're very, very happy to point out the negatives in other culture. And so I, I kind of look at myself, and I, and I'm always active about my own culture because I want to point out to people that we have negative things in our culture. If I see bad behavior in our culture, I point it out. If I see bad behavior in my own culture, in my own self. I point it out and I apologize for it, you know, because I think that's the way to go forward is to appreciate uh, the negative and the positives in your culture. But always, always try to bring a balance to that without just pushing the negative narrative about it. And so, you know, so, you know, um, when people start writing um, comic books with an agenda right now, which is for the last five years has been all about gender. That's why the failure of the comic book industry, mainstream Marvel and DC is so prominent right now. That's why people just can't handle it because they want to write books about from the negative side. Like saying racism is bad. Don't you know racism is bad? Everybody knows racism is bad. Don't you know treating people is bad? Um, in a bad way is bad? Everybody knows that. Don't you know bad behavior is bad? Everybody knows that. You don't have to throw that at people's faces, you know, because, and you don't have to say everybody in that culture is bad because we know that ev not everybody in my culture isn't bad. There are some amazing people in my culture, but there are some really, really bad people in my culture. And some of them have prominent places. That's why when I'm um, um, talking about locally, talking about uh, Shane um, Jones talked about the radical, radical Indians. I was like, he's right. They only care about pushing an agenda, those radicals. The quiet ones in our community who are really working hard and just, just going about the business, you know, running the stores, running, looking after families, going to temple, whatever. they just do, going about their business like normal Kiwis do. So, But then there will have the activists who will be out there saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. Those are the ones that actually ruin it for everybody else. But sometimes... You know, uh, us with you know with the more prominent, I guess, uh, or are more vocal on the other side. Say, look, guys, tone it down. That's when that needs to be done. It's like, look, you're not doing anyone any good. And that's what. So when I was start writing that, I thought, hold on, I need to. When I first wrote the first uh, first forty pages, I was like, really aggro, um, because there was a lot of mistreatment. But then out of that came such a good things. That our people could just be born now and go over, you know, over the last five generations, travel to the, around the world, get on the bus. Uh, I mean, sorry, get on a sh on a boat, get on a plane, raise children everywhere else because the parents worked hard through all that trouble. They worked so hard. Um, so, like I said, I read a lot of books just to understand before I decided to write that. And so when. Then I decided, well, hold on, hold on. You're a bit angry right now. This is not the way to write a book. Let's just put that aside. Just chill out for a little while and then come back to it when you actually have a better understanding of the positive as well. And I have for the last five years. Like I, I started in about 2009, uh, 2008, 2009. I started working on it. So I got 40 pages done, full color. Got, got it done. I was doing everything myself. And then I just stopped writing it. I have the whole entire story written, I mean, outlined done. Um, and so I stopped writing it and I thought, okay, we'll just leave it for a while and come back to it when I'm in a happier, more positive mood. And that might be another five years before I still finish it. But I mean, I'm in a, you know, I want to see that book succeed as a good, as a historical thing because it's a, it's a fictional 
history-based romantic book, all right, uh, with a love story, but also saying what happened, not sugarcoating anything, but actually showing that these two people got through that and how they got through that well, while showing the actual reality of what was there and who helped them. We never, we, none of us are where we are without anybody helping us, right? without our families helping us, without our neighbors helping us. We're not where we are now on our own, right? We didn't lace up our boots by ourselves. Our mom and dad had to teach us how to tie our boots, right? Or tie our shoes. I talk about boots because I used to wear Doc Martens in my teens. Okay, which brings me to music. I found that like... Uh, and this is a proof, in fact, as well, that like when you're in your teens, the music you love listening to in your teens is the music you listen to for the rest of your life and love for the rest of your life. So I, I, I'm a grunge kid, right? Um, 90s, you know, wow, almost 30 years ago. 90s, uh, I was listening to grunge, Alice in Chains, uh, Tool, um, Nirvana. I haven't listened to Nirvana yet. I'll have to get it. Smashing Pumpkins, and you know that whole um, Jane's Addiction and all that said, and because when you those are the things that uh, like when you're in teens, you the reason those music's mus, um, those music means so much is that it's kind of like escapism. If you're into you know music is always like escapism, as I say, entertainment is escapism is that when you listen to music, you basically are connecting to what the lyrics saying with the motions of it and stuff and so you're able to just lock yourself away as i said a week ago it's about finding a space just to calm yourself down and relax and that music is very helpful in that and we all know that and entertainment wise yeah but also emotionally wise so you can basically sit there and you know listen to some music and you know it just reminds me of my favorite song uh one of my favorite songs right uh, institutionalized, you know, a kid sitting in his room and his mom and dad goes, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? Because like, I'm just chilling out. Yeah. Smashing Punks is excellent. Yeah. Alex, just listening to Gish, the album Gish just before, was every show <laughs> before this. Uh, and yeah, I am one and you are three, I think it was. And so that sort of, um, if you, you know, it's important to just basically, uh, well, enjoy that moment again because it reminds me of the things because a teenage when you're a teenager right you go through a lot of emotions because your hormones are thinking up you're hitting puberty and in those um five eight seven eight years right seven years or so five to seven years you you you're going through so much things at school you know girls boys whatever um teachers homework stress all that trying to trying to set up for the future and so music becomes a very important part of your life and you sort of like spend hours just listening to it because that's what you know that's what keeps you um, um connected uh you know somehow on an emotional level and an escapism level so um yeah okay um I think I've done everything. So the next thing I want to do is do some unboxing. All right. I've, um, I don't think I've ever done unboxing on our, on our streams. Um, so the first one, and as you can see, it's unopened. It's uh, Jessica Jones from the Netflix show. I love the, I love this. I don't like the last season of Jennifer Jones, uh, Jessica Jones. I thought it, was, it started out really trash. It was okay. It, it really, the writing really dropped. But the first, um, I think the first two seasons or so, or the first season, was brilliant. And that's why I got this. I saved up for this. I paid it off on a weekly basis, a couple of bucks. Uh, it took me a little while. Okay. So it's got this beautiful um, little um, cardboard, um, you know, whatever they call it, a slip case, whatever. Just, just amazing, beautiful picture, black and white. This amazing, and I've read the comic books, and I've got the first graphic novel, and um, it's one of my favorites. So let's do this. All right, it's all three of them unopened, right? Let's see what this is like. Whew. All right. 
I got it. Okay. Let me bring this down a bit so you guys can see a bit um, better. Excuse me. There we go. All right. There we go. Okay. Unboxing the just net, um, Netflix uh, version of just just get your eyes. Let's hit the box first and see what's in here. Okay. All right. So that's basically nothing in there apart from this little thing. So they've got this uh, little licensed product for Diamond Select. Yeah, the same diamond that's basically closed now. So let's see. So they got the whole. Uh, what is this? The dioramas. Um, I'm just checking for Jessica Jones on this. I'm just seeing if they're um, on there and what the imagery is. I guess they have all separate ones. So they're not showing the Jessica Jones ones on there. So this is all the different ones. I think uh, um, this is this range here. Uh, the gallery range is what they're saying. Uh, sculpted by Gentle Giant. So as seen on... Netflix, and then they got the Avengers Infinity War um, there. All right, they got the Defenders, and in the back they got the other one, other characters, and even that one there. Um, I'll unbox this tomorrow. I've already unboxed it because I love this character. It was my first one of the big ones that I bought. So as you can see, I'm about to unbox this one as well. So yeah, okay. Nope, I forgot. Sometimes they have Solitech. Yep, they do. They have a Solitech here. And they have a long Solitech. Oh, no, short Solitech. So there's two on each side. Is there one at the bottom? Just to make sure before I break something. Popping out. And there you go. Let me just bring this down a bit more. Alright, so there's amazing Jessica Jones doing her punch. Uh, let me just get this closer. There you go. It's not... I think they could have done a better job with the detail there on the face because of the pricing on this. And um, yeah, but um, it kind of looks like her, but doesn't. That's a weird thing, doesn't it? It's like, like you look at... Um, where is it? Uh. So, if you look at that, right? If you look at the face there of, um, I forgot her name now, man. Wait, it doesn't even say who the actress was on there. Okay, well, let's... Alex, if you're still watching, uh, can you tell me um, who the actress was on that? I've just forgotten. I might remember her in a sec. But it's got a beautiful little um, 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 setting there, right? Um, gutter, which is pretty cool, uh, like that, on a street. Uh, it's got a little spray can. Just say spray paint on it, as you can see. No smell. Yeah, so it's a very decent plastic. Very hard plastic, no smell. She's yeah, got her cool boots on. Details on the boots are great, um, and yeah, everything's pretty cool on this. But the face does not look like the actress, because I would have thought that like if they're gonna go that far with every other detail, why not make the face look like Jessica, um, the actress? Okay, so yeah, but I mean, as you can see, I mean, like so much detail. Check it out on the jacket. Whoops. And, I, and, I, and I've had to do a jacket for um, Incredible, as you can, um, as you might have seen on the, if you're reading the Incredible comics. Man, it, it takes a lot of effort <laughs> to really do a good job on the actual art for these things to make sure that, you know, every sort of little things, uh, you know, creases and stuff, uh, the lumping together of like, um, of, you know, 
cre um, creases and lumping together, of clothing together, all that, you know, hand movements, all that. Um, also, what fists look like, what fingers look like, how to do it without making it cartoony. So yeah, so everything on here is really good, apart from the face. Does not look like it. All right. So yeah, my first unboxing. And if you're just joining, that's the first uh, unboxing of the Netflix Jessica Jones Defenders. Um, yeah, uh, uh, figuring. Very very cool. Very large. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's Jessica Jones from the Gallery Range by um, I think it was who was that that made it? Where is it? A piece of paper. I think it's Gentle Giant. Was the um, or the sculptures on this? Um, here we go. Yep, sculpted by Gentle uh, Gentle Giant. Oh no, sorry, sorry, my bad. Uh, I think the Defenders Range uh, sculpted by Tat Amala Amila. Everybody else seems to be. Um, yeah, as you can see, everybody else looks pretty good on this, right? I want to get them. Uh, hopefully, I can get me my um, my Punisher. I love Punisher, and I'll and I'll, and I'll do my whole range of Pun Punisher toys and comics tomorrow, and uh, so that you guys can yeah, something different tomorrow. So I'll just yeah do your whole Punisher thing. That's off the top of my head, not planned. So yeah, all right, we'll do that tomorrow. So next up is Old Man Logan. Now, Mark Miller, right, and I just want to say that first, that first, first series is amazing. Old Man Logan, let me put, put me down again and slightly up, is amazing. That, that, um, that eight issue, I think it was, of set, you know, of a future world where um, most of the heroes are dead is a great great book great book and um if you can get a hold of the graphic novel or the digital um uh, copies to read or uh, buy um you know do that read it it's really good oh um it's got a bit of dust here so i'm just going to wipe it off because it's just been sitting there i haven't opened it as you can see it's still got the tag on um haven't opened it since since i got it the strange thing about this one it doesn't have the flap that Jessica Jones had. I mean, it's the same range, right? So why don't you have the flap? It just seems like a bit of a ripoff if you're going to have it in one. But maybe because it's a bit more expensive item. All right. So this is the gallery range again, right? And um, on the back, you got all the all the details about who he is, what he's going to look like, and as you can see, oops. Yep. There you go. He's got his fists up. And he's got his uh, claws out. All right, let's do this. Oop. Get this um, cube out of the way. Oh, maybe I should have looked a bit better in the box when I bought it. Because, oh, no, the box doesn't show it. Okay, let me just show before, I, uh, why I said, oh, if you can see this, right, hopefully you guys can see that. There is nothing that shows you what's about to come. This is just the image, the front thing. So like I said, there was no flap, right? So back again, this, this one's got the seller tape down, that little package pamphlet that came with it. So that the other one was loose, so this was um, laying down. Let me see. All right, so this one has some other range of um, toy um, figurines, and you can see there's a Wolverine with a different look, um, different stance, I should say. And then on the back, you've got I think it's the same as the other one. Yeah, the other range that was there. Is that? Oh, it's Medusa. And so that's all the females, but yeah. And of course, the terrible Miss Marvel. Uh, anyway, 
the new Miss Marvel. I, I love the old Miss Marvels. Uh, Captain Marvel, I should say, not Miss Marvel. Okay, so. Alright. Oh! No sellotape on this one. Alright, so no sellotape and no flop. So no holding it together in case it moves around. Okay. So. Check it out. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's why I got it, because it's just... And I love... What I love is overalls. I have Long coats. I love long coats. I have about two or three of them. Uh, my first one, which made me fall in love with my, with my dad's one that he got of, of his um, New Zealand customs friend. And, um, and, and I had it for ages. Like, I was to wore around everywhere because I just loved it in the 2000s. And I left it somewhere and got stolen. Or ended up somewhere else and and I missed it so later later on I paid another eighty dollars for a brand new one all right on trade me so I bought eighty dollars and then I also have a gray one oh, I'm sorry a beige one that I wear because I bought a beige one because of course uh, John Constantine wears it Hellblazer wears it Johnny Boy wears it and so I I love long coats it just has a, such a distinct thing so you know one of my characters will have something like that because I just love long coats so if you can see he doesn't once again he doesn't look like the comic book um old man logan face if you look at that one compared to this it doesn't look like it and i and i don't know why they couldn't do that because look at all the other details like check out the fist here oops sorry let me see if i can um put the flash on if i can get this no it's not coming up anyway so but what I, what I said oh about, right, is this in the back. So you got the Captain the Captain America shield, and you got the top half of the helmet and the top half of um, Iron Man, as you can see. So he's standing on the rocks. Uh, sort of a rocky mound, um, hollow there at the bottom there, but this is a quite a good solid uh, piece of plastic, and it's really really nice, and the details are really good, and once again, like I said, like everything on these things are really detailed. Ooh, nearly snapped the, <laughs> grabbed the old um, claws really thing. So they're really well done there. They they they're not like really cheap plastic. You're right, yeah. Christopher Lambert in uh, Highlander, he was cool in his raincoat. Um, Alex says, yeah, they he was. And this sort of thing, it's just, his raincoats are really, really cool, man. And like, especially, you know, the beige ones is just such an iconic thing. Um, yeah. And this, this, it's just such a cool thing. I mean, it's just something you can just wrap around on you and just, you know, stop the rain or, or have it as, um, you know, just to wrap around your legs if you're getting cold or, or just have it open and flapping. So yeah, so amazing detail on everything except the face. But I can I can, you know, unlike that, unlike the um, the Jessica Jones one, I'll let this one pass because it's it's got enough details. Like you look at the like, over here, right on this head, forehead, right, um, the strain, whatever they call it, I don't know. But yeah, look at just look at across the body here with the sh um, shape. With um, with the creases, with the muscles, tones, and then you got the nice little um, ripples across here, and you know just amazing details of the jacket. Um, whoops, sorry, of the jacket um, um, sleeves. But also, I mean, the um, the blades are really good. The blades are really good. They're not. Uh, I found that sometimes they have the very cheap, uh, not very cheap, but very. Um, they're not strong, right? They're too flexible. This one, it's very, it's strong enough, right? It's, it's strong enough to handle it. So, yeah. Um, and another thing, I just noticed that there's this, you know, smash here in, in, um, in old Iron Man's chest, right? And we've got a blast from something, right? But it's just so cool to see this at the back of it. So they haven't really wasted, um, I think it's Tara. Um, who, let me see who um, did the artwork on this. Might be able to find it in the other one. Where are you? 
There's that one. Phil Ramirez. So Phil Ramirez is the one who did the um, artwork on this. You can see it there. Uh, and he did a good job. He didn't waste the base, right? Just like the other one, they didn't waste the base space. And I think this is really, really good. This is really, really good. I like it. It's nice and solid. But of course, you know, you're going to have to make sure that it's not too, uh, you know, that the, um, wherever you're displaying it, it'll be in my cabinet. Uh, and the boxes, sometimes I just um, recently, um, about two, uh, the start of the year or end of last year, I boxed everything. I put them all in the boxes and even the, um, what was it, the pop, Funko Pops, I put them all in the boxes because I always keep the boxes if I, if I remember to. And I just put in the cupboard. So the top of my cupboard here in the wardrobe is full of boxes that aren't already in, you know, in these things. So they go all, they go back in the boxes and they just get displayed as boxes because it's easy to display them if you don't have a space, just pile boxes on top of each other. So, like I said, this is this is a really, really good, um, you know, really, really good figure. Got the old Iron Man, and I love the fact that Iron Man's on there. And I'm sure Sandy would like appreciate the fact that Iron Man's there represented. And then you've also got the Captain America fans. And talk about Captain America. I don't like somebody else taking over his roles if they already have their own. Uh, if they have their own thing, like the, uh, I can't remember the guy with. Um, the black guy with the hawk uh, flying thing. I don't want it to be Captain America. And as far as I'm concerned, Infinity War is the last, last uh, Avengers thing I'm going to watch. I'll just go back and watch those. I don't want to watch anything else that comes afterwards because they just change too much and they just do it for gender reasons, not for just for actual good storytelling. But yeah, let me just pop out um, Jessica Jones back up. So you can see, um, like I was saying, you got a uh, I forgot to talk about the pipe here, apart from just the gutter there, but this, you get a spray can, really cool, and you've got the pipe. So I, I think I've got a um, a Luke Cage that I'm getting, right? And so, because, yeah, um, I like the character. I've seen the first season, I love the first season, haven't seen the first se second season. And, yeah, so... I guess that's me for today. Let me just check what I've got on my laptop because I had some um, screens open. Uh, that's me today for about this, but let's see what we got here just in case before I finish, if there's anything else I need to chat about. Um, let me see what we got on DC here. Yep, that one's covered. All right, so anime. Let's talk about anime. So My, Ameri uh, my Hero Academia viewers Criticize Studio Bones for animation quality of Pussycat's return. Now, I haven't seen season three or four of My Hero Academia, so I'm not sh I can't remember who the character is. But so this is re reporting from uh, Bounding in the Comics. Uh, Spencer Bacall writes, um, yes, today, I guess, being the 30th in America, we're on 31st, last day of the month for us. Okay, unless, we no, that's 31st, yeah. My Hero Academia fandom, oh, excuse me, let me get a drink. My Hero Academia fandom has once again taken issue with an element of the series production. This time criticizing animation studio, studio Bones for the animation quality of one frame. One frame. Seen in the latest episode. On March 29th, the 24th episode of My Hero Academia, fourth season, Japanese Hero Billboard chart made its debut in Japan. Oh, I guess that's the name of the um, episode. It is, sorry, I just didn't write, read it right. The episode, Japanese Hero Billboard Chart, made its debut in Japan. In the episode, as hero rankings are released in, to the public, the Wild Wild Pussycats team makes a surprise visit to UA, hi, uh, to check their respective ranking. During their visit, they run into Class A1, sorry, Class 1A, and perform their group introduction to, the, to assure the students of their return. However, some members of the fandom took issue with the quality of the frame showing the wow, group's final post, considering it to be an inexcusable adaptation of mangaka Kohai Kori, Hori Koshi's original work. So, yeah. 
Fandom sometimes can be really bad. One frame. I don't know, man. It's sometimes, like I say, sometimes I can be negative about what's happening, but one frame. <laughs> anyway, so that's that's. You can read the rest of that on um, bounding into com uh, into comics dot com. Yep, on their on their um, website there. Covered that. Uh, talking about, um, let's go back to the beer bug. Evangeli Evang Evangeline Lily apologized for de declaring her family would not live under Corona house. Yeah, beer bug house arrest, right? So, Ant Wasp from Ant Man and Wasp. Uh, the star of offered an apology after previously declaring she would not live under house arrest. Earlier this month, Lily took to Instagram where she declared her family would not be living under such and such repetition there. When asked by a fan, no beer bug house arrest, uh, Lily responded, not for my family, not for this family. Uh, she came under a huge criticism uh, from everybody, basically. And then later on, she said, um, some people value their lives over freedom. Some people value freedom over their lives. We will make our choices with res love and respect. And then um, she went on to say, hey, hello, I'm responding to um, this person. I'm living with my father at the moment who has stage four leukemia. I'm also immune, immune compromised at the moment. I have two young kids. Some value their lives over freedom. Some value freedom over their lives. We all make res our choices with love and respect. Um, later on, she went on to say... Um, respond to somebody else i think we i think we all need to slow down take a breath and look at the facts we are being um presented with they do not add up to all to the all out global lockdown control uh, pandemonia and sanity we are experiencing i hope that people will find their peace and sanity where you are soon sending you love and prayers okay so later on she came back and she said i want to offer my sincere and heartfelt apology for the insensitivity I offered in my previous post to the very real suffering and fear that has gripped the world through beer bag. Grandparents, parents, children, sisters and brothers are dying. The world is rallying to find a way to stop this very real threat and my ensuring silence has sent a dismissive, arrogant and cryptic message. She then noted she, um, she is heartened by how she sees people treating each other during the pandem pandemic. At the same time, I'm heartened by the beauty and humanity I see, I see so many people demonstrating toward one another to this vulnerable, in this vulnerable time. When I was grappling with my own fears over social distancing, one kind, wise, one kind and wise and gracious person said to me, do it out of love, not fear. And it helped me re to realize my place in all of this. So yeah, so as you know, she was out there basically saying, I'm not going to do what you tell me. This reminded me of, talk about the 90s, reminded me of um, Rage Against the Machine. Um, okay, so that's that. So, next up. New rumor reveals who Christian Bale will play in Thor, Love and Thunder. And uh, the rumor has details that um, he'll, um, of who he will play in Taika's, our own Taika Waititi's upcoming Love and Thunder story. Um, and he will play, be playing Beta Ray Bill. And I'll put a post of, um, you know, a screenshot of who Battle Royale Bill is later on in this, once we finished here. Yeah, so, and he said, um, let me see. Tessa Thompson noted, yeah, yeah, I've read the script. I can't tell you much, but lots of exciting text messages exchanged between Natalie and I, and we're going to have fun. Uh, she went on to add, we know Taika's writing, directing, some familiar faces, some new people in the mix. Christian Bell is going to play our villain which is going to be fantastic. So there you have it. Christian Bale is going to be a villain in the new, um, well, that's a rumor, but she's confirming it, right? He will be a villain, but they're saying that he might be Beta Ray Bill. I'm not too familiar with Beta Ray Bill, but I've seen him. He's kind of got a, like a horse face, an actual horse face, if I remember right. Um, he's, a, from that, he's an alien race character. So that's it from Bounding Into Comics, and you can read the rest on their website. Uh, and that's for... Uh, the movie Taika's new movie, um, Love and Thunder, Thor: Love and Thunder movie, come, um, you know, of course that's on hiatus, but I guess once it goes into production. All right, so that's that.
Let's see what else we got here. Right, so I mentioned early on that um, Sony delays Mobius, Ghostbusters, Uncharted, and more. Sony has reportedly delayed um, those three you mentioned, um, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Uncharted, and Peter Rabbit 2, The Runaway, and an untitled Marvel Sony picture in 2021. So that's from Bar Brady. And so, yeah, a lot of delays there. On, as I mentioned, there will be delays, and that's what's happening. Um, what else we got here? Right, Netflix is courting Ryan Reynolds for, uh, this is from Bleeding Full, for a uh, live-action Dragon's Lair series. That's interesting. So I haven't read this, so let's read this together, all right? Let's go through this together. So um, Bleeding Full writes, Ryan Reynolds may have found his next guest, a quest. Reynolds is in talks to star and produce a live action feature film, a feature adaptation of Dragon's Lair, one of the most iconic arcade video games from the 1990s. Now, that is cool. I, I love Ryan Reynolds. He's just an amazing character. And I've, and I've been, uh, you know, I've posted with, um, in response to some of um, Rob Liefeld, who's the creator of De um, Deadpool, about his, how Reynolds was, is the best person they could have ever chosen to do Deadpool. And he agrees. Of course he agrees, but yeah, I love it. Now, I think he'll do great. So, also, they mentioned, like, while um, so Sonic was doing so well, people, you know, people in the um, in the blogosphere and um, online were commenting on how, how uh, arcade game, uh, game-based movies don't make much money, and then, lo and behold, after the changes, after the fans called for changes to Sonic uh, design, everybody who was into Sonic, even me who doesn't know much about Sonic, went to watch it and really, really loved the movie. And they've made millions, hundreds of millions, and will still make hundreds of millions when it goes into stream. I mean, for the, you know, for the whoever's streaming it. So, backtrack here. So, the most, yeah, Dragon Slayer is one of the most iconic video games from the 1980s. So all you guys who played that, I remember playing it. I remember having it at home somewhere. Because um, Dad was really into gaming, and he still is into gaming. All right, so I've got most of his games now. Okay, so after almost a year of negotiations, Netflix has closed a deal to pick up the rights to the game. Roy Lee will produce via his Vertigo Entertainment with Trevor Engelson of Underground Films. Ruth, uh, Don Bluth, Gary Oldman, Goldman, for a minute there I thought it was an actor, Gary Oldman, from Dracula, and John Pomeroy are also producing, Reynolds will produce via his banner, Maximum Effort. Dan and uh, Kevin Hageman, will, who worked on the Lego movie, most recently, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, will write the script. Leia, okay, Leia, uh, Dragon's Leia, at, at one point, the most popular game in America, it hit the scene in 1983 and promised to revolutionize the arcade industry with movie-style animation that held from Bluth, who would later go to direct, um, direct animated movies and American Tale and All Dogs Go to Heaven. And it envelops, envelop pushing, it's envelope pushing technology um, that used laser discs to, the adva to advance the story. While the game's high point faded as its style didn't take off, it remains fondly remembered and even made an appearance in the 80s set A Stranger Things. So the cool so of course Stranger Things is like the game changer now for everybody because it's about my generation, right? That grew up in the 80s. And so it's why it's taking off is because it's about kids from that generation. Now, if you put adults from that generation, it'll go to a higher um, age group. Of course, these are adults and stuff, but Stranger Things has this is, is good in the sense that it has children and then children enjoy watching it. I know my my family, my uh, you know my um, my niece and nephews love it. They watch it, watch it, and over and over, right? Each season, and they can't wait for the next season. And I already knew what the where was heading as soon as I watched the last episode. And they were like, "Do you think? Do you think?" I said, "It already stays in the last season." But yeah, so that's the thing of it so if you if, if you've got a show that's like um like stranger things promoting 80s um culture uh, that generation of games of uh, um, fandom and those are the guys that are actually making bank now for yeah no 
we are who Hollywood's making bank of, yet sometimes they like to spit in our faces. Like I said, with Dana Swartz, with this, uh, with this uh, Gotham High and stuff. So, um, yeah, so I think it'll be cool. I think um, anything that Ryan Reynolds and I will watch, hands down. Um, there's something that I'll, I'll put a link to that you should really think about watching called The Nines. Um, all right, so let's see what's the last bit. Right, so Kevin Feige and Marvel Studios pushing for Spider Man, Spider Woman, and MCU. So this is the direction they're going in for the um, for the Phase Four of MCU is making it really Avengers uh, female uh, based and stuff. I have no problem with that as long as it's a good story. But I'm I'm done after Infinity Wars anyway. So they're looking at saying under the captaincy of President Kevin Feige, Marvel Studios has um, continuously been pushing for more diversity in the films, and I hate that word. So anyway, you guys can read the rest of it there. Reports have indicated that Fahey is in deals with um, Sony to bring, because I, Sony owns Spider-Woman. The whole Spider-Universe, Spider-Man universe is owned, the villains and all that is owned by Sony. Um, cool. So that's that done there. Um, and of course we said for um, uh, DC Comics release to release digital only comics for the month of April. Oh, 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 if you're an older person like me and has watched, uh, have read 2000 AD, and if you are, um, if you watched my um, earlier, um, a couple couple of days ago, maybe last week, where I talked about uh, 2000 AD and my love of that, the whole series when I was young growing up with, um, and Regan was one who introduced me to it, my neighbor across the road from me, my good friend, and um, the 2080s uh, and the, in the mid 80s or late 80s carried a character called the slain the Han god now it's the cool i used, i actually i love the art and i actually made a huge like a freaking meter high when i was film uh, art school here i was doing ceramics was my whole thing uh, sculpturing was my whole thing so i made a huge bowl a clay bowl which broke later on because I gifted it to some place and it had a crack in it and then convenience just got smashed. I actually did one of my favorite and I, I did it a second time. So the first time was painted, right? And I might actually go back and paint the scene where he's falling into the underworld. And this is about, if you're just joining me, this is talking about Pat Mills and Simon Beasley's Slain the Hon God from 2000 AD series. It was, uh, you know, uh, weekly serialized in there in the 80s and maybe early 90s. So when I came back to live in Whangarei in about, from Auckland, in about um, 94, 95, I actually bought the graphic novel that they had collected. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that they're saying that they're going to do a hardcover collection of the Hon God series. Now it's written by Pat Mills, amazing 2080 writer, and he's a great writer. But the artwork was what delivered it um, and I'll post this um, the links for this down here. The Horn God is one of the one of the really really amazing Celtic um, uh, story uh, storylines. As a, a it's like the Celtic version of Conan, like their own warrior. And oh, the amazing characters. I'm just looking at the cover here, the collector's edition cover here, and it's just beautiful. And um, I was so much into it. I think it was about 94, I'd say, or 95, when I actually um, got like a meter, meter by 550 wide uh, panel, uh, uh, mesh board, jib board panel, and I painted the scene. Like it's one of my first, I think, proper painted scenes that I did acrylic as a project. And then later on, because I loved that scene so much, uh, he was basically naked falling in, uh, into water. And it's kind of weird because uh, I've got a, a, the page I'm doing right now for Incredible has her falling into water in a, in a bathrobe, uh, into the sea, I should say. And so, yeah, it's kind of a really, I was thinking about how to do it. And like, I'm actually doing it the way it's actually done, you know, the, the, um, the figure, the arching of the back and it's done pretty similar to this. It's, and I haven't read this for about 20 years, man. 
which is kind of cool. So, yeah. Um, so, Slain the Horn God, the collected series, right? Hardcover. And I am definitely want to get this. All right. Uh, it's a 208 page, uh, 226, 27.5 centimeter by 21 centimeter paperback is out at um, in North America in 26th, well, May. They're looking at and Ireland in 28th of May. Uh, a special limited hardcover edition is also available from the um, 2080 web shop. I'm going to have to get me a copy of that because that's one of my, my, um, 20 you know it's 20 years ago right uh when i used to be really into it um i mean i'm still into it i haven't read it for so long but um it says here there are only a handful of comics that can legitimately be lay claim to having changed comics slain the horn god is inarguably among them and this new edition gives readers a chance to relish simon beasley's artwork and uh, going back to what i saw the other week that how i love simon beasley's artwork and i was talking about how i wrote wrote to vertigo dc vertigo at that time when they were about 275 pages or 285 issue out and i wrote a letter to that saying how i enjoyed and loved seeing simon beasley's work on that and especially the covers so you know i'm not just saying yeah doing a puff thing on this i really really love his artwork and i actually said that almost 15 years ago in that magazine and so and 10 years prior to that i guess uh, and, and that comic book, 10 years prior to that, I actually bought this, um, you know, and I was reading it on a weekly basis, and I was actually bought the graphic novels, because the artwork is amazing. So I'll put a link in there for that, and that's being reported from Bleeding Fool. And let me just check the time here, guys, and I think we're in about an um, hour and 25 minutes, so a lot of things covered today, a couple of interesting unboxings, Old Man Logan, Jessica Jones, uh, from from Netflix, but Old Man Logan from the comic book. And I think this might be because of the new Old Man Logan. That's why it looks that way, that they brought back after 2008. Right? So, thank you for watching, guys. Malfunction. Um, wearing my old comic trade um, t-shirt. Still only have the one, because I think I lent out a couple. I still got to hopefully get it back. Um, they were designed the new ones at um, Seven Design later on. Well, that's beautiful design. And this was my design, but Seven's design is amazing. All right, so hopefully I can find those two somewhere. Um, apart from that, thank you for joining me and stay safe, stay home, un unless you have to go to the medication or food. Um, Kakite anu. See you tomorrow. I'm not sure if it's at nine o'clock or, or seven o'clock again. It depends. Those are two times I can um, I'll broadcast it. Uh, but right now I'm working really hard. I've got two comics, uh, three comics on the go. I've got to finish and critical tonight, uh, page 19. I'm doing the two bubbles um, debating, um, which is on our Plunge Enterprises page, uh, business page. Um, also um, slowly working through the last issue of the circle. So very busy, and you know just because the world's stopping and i'm stuck at home i'm still doing my three projects as soon as my um the circle finishes then i can jump on to another project but thank you guys for jumping actually i'm doing four projects because um seven's uh, working on um red dot right now he's doing the artwork for that right now so we, I'm, co I'm writing that he's a co-creator he's doing the artwork on that so yeah thank you guys uh being it's starting to get a bit, a bit worn out with the, with the stresses, but guess what? We're here. You're here. We're safe. Stay safe. And look after the kids. And look after your parents, elderly parents and stuff. Make sure everybody's got the food. Make sure you've got toilet paper. Make sure you're kind to each other. And that's the most important thing right now. When you're stressing out, take a breath. Count to five. And then, you know, once you're calm, then respond. Kakite See you tomorrow, guys.